Hi, um, I'm Yifan Lee. I'm the publisher of Orientations Magazine. I'm going to be moderating this panel tonight. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Um, I'm just going to give a brief introduction to the speakers. To my right is Fred Gordon. He is a collector of Chinese modern and contemporary ink painting, who is also the executive producer of this documentary. Over there, we have Professor Wang, who received her PhD in history and anthropology from Harvard University. And she now teaches in the School of Chinese at the University of Hong Kong. Her research interests include the fields of Chinese history and anthropology, with topics ranging from ancient cosmo cosmology and political agency to art, subjectivity, and community in Mao's China. She is currently working on a book on clandestine art and artist societies during Chinese, China's Cultural Revolution. The last panelist is Ouyang Kaibing, who is a PhD candidate in the School of, Chi School of Chinese at the University of Hong Kong. His dissertation is on Mu Xing, with a particular focus on the link between the author's late style and Chinese liter literary modernity. I'm going to invite Professor Wang to give us a brief, brief background on Mu Xing and to set the stage for the time and to share why she thinks this artist is important. Thank you for the kind introduction. Um, it's actually, I just realized it's uh, very difficult to speak first after this powerful film. Um, I felt I would like to be silent for a while. But since the task is on me to provide audience with, uh, with the historical context of the artist and uh, highlight his value in, in, in art history and in our history, human history, um, I will try to do my best. Uh, we have seen that. I think I will focus on two things. First, I provide this context. Secondly, I want to say how Mu Xin's art uh, creation was the effort of actually overcoming that context, of refusing to, to be defined by the context. So, so when I introduce the historical context, this is not the definition of Mu Xin. Uh, instead, it's the other way around. We have seen that um, Mu Xin was born at that very historical moment of 1927, uh, 10 years before Japanese invaded his uh, birthplace, and uh, the very year when the split of uh, communist and, and, and uh, KMT, the ruling party, uh, leading towards the future wars and the revolutions was just beginning. At that historical moment, we saw this young boy reading this almost secret and sacred books from this private, mysterious library of a personal library of a famous writer who was no longer in town. Okay, the boy was in charge of this library, reading these books. I'm not sure if you have noticed that all these big names from Renaissance to the modernist a great literature giants he was reading, but he was reading in Chinese. You probably have noticed that and had a question mark there. And this tells us, first of all, he was not only born, in, born into this uh, originally very uh, wealthy family in the very uh, in a nourished, rich, culturally rich and financially rich town and region, he was also a son of the Chinese May Force movement that for two decades, the translator, the best literature hands went into translation, making it possible for the young man to, to, young man to be nurtured by books coming from other sides of the world, and, you know, all the classics. And then when he made that, uh, uh, he said he, as a boy he wanted to paint uh, as a Michelangelo. He went to Shanghai to study. He also studied with two great artists 
who founded the modern Chinese art in China, uh, Liu Hai Su's school, and the Lin Feng Mian uh, as a personal teacher. So once again, in this uh, very unfortunately short and fragile period of China entering modernity, he was nurtured while the family was in decline, the nation was falling into the war. He was nurtured by this cultural richness produced by the generations of artists and writers, uh, making this young mind's early uh, bloom possible. So that's one historical background I want to introduce that he did. Even so, his art and writing seemed to be coming from nowhere and then just left us like that. But it's coming from uh, this very rich cultural background. Not to mention that with his uh, exposure in Jiangnan, with that kind of family background, that he was well educated in classical Chinese and classical Chinese art at the same time, so that he could combine the East West the very best in his early, uh, as early nutrition, I would say, that is very uh, well nurtured in his uh, early age. Um, the film opened with the scene of the Cultural Revolution. That is a period uh, I share with, with Mu Xin personally. It, was also, it is also a subject I'm still dedicating my life teaching at Hong Kong U. I think it's very important, as Chen Danqing said, not to forget. Uh, it's a new way to shut people up, is to forget about ugly things, look forward, uh, look into the future. So uh, during that very period, he suffered uh, literally the imprisonment of, uh, like, like he said, it's not just himself. Many people suffered uh, same, similar kind of fate. And to make, to make it, uh, I, I, try, I try not to say too much on the subject that I teach every day, right? Um, I, I want to focus on something here, that 10 years of cultural illusion, he was, in that basement, he also spent many years in labor reform. Uh, and the in and out of imprisonments and surveillance, which did not end with Mao's death, it lasted until the very end of the 1970s, till 78, 79, he was still uh, under the civilian, okay? Did not have personal freedom. But artistic creation, and writing, and particularly painting, was the way he lived. I feel personally connected to him, and I think the very reason why I ended up sitting here tonight was that during that very period, uh, even though I was much younger, I and a group of friends, we were painting too. So we were an underground group, painting uh, first personally, isolatedly, and then in the late 70s, around the uh, time of 1973, small individuals and small groups um, became a one more solid underground painting group that we painted exactly similar kind of motifs and kind of art, not same media, not same uh, you know, coloring and things, uh, but we painted the kind of painting that, is, number one, is apolitical. You could not explain uh, artistic uh, creation of Mu Xin with any political interpretation as oppressed, as a victim, as oppressor, as a revolution, as a, uh, from China, from Mao's era. You cannot put any of the labels on his imaginary visual world. That's exactly the same phenomena as our group that we were painting the moonlight, we were painting the lakes, we were painting the landscape, sunsets, flowers, trees. We were drawn to that kind of imaginary uh, space or the world. We're using art to create a space that's not our lived reality. So we share this with Mu Xin because 
this kind of private apolitical art, up to today, is still very hard to decipher, to read, because often when we read art from Mao China or from China, even today, we're expecting to see symbols, uh, political symbols, either political propaganda art you saw in the documentary, or the resistance to the political propaganda art, like you today, you can see the political pop, like Zhang Xiaogang, you know, you collectors, you all know what, what's selling on the market. They all have that political symbol on it, either Maoist or uh, political satire of Maoist symbols. But Mu Xin's art precisely was a creation against this reality. It's so pure and so clean and purely his spiritual existence that he used art to create he himself, his identity, his life, and his being. And that is something I think still waiting to be understood in the artistic world. So that leads to uh, the entire experience shared with the Cultural Revolution and how he dealt with it. As an artist, he dealt with it through creation of creating a self and an imaginary world through art. And then that leads us to the post-Mao era when a lot of people got rich and more people got poor. But he went on to Sanbu, take a walk. He took a walk to New York and took a walk uh, further into his creative, imaginative world. If you look at his painting uh, of this 33 uh, you know, painting down in China, which ended up in the museum, ended up in Yale collection, and the painting he did in the US, and then after his return to China, it's very, very different. It's, it's by the same person. It's the same aesthetics, same world. But artistically, he went very, very far. Not only he sort of used art to erase the reality uh, that tried to shape him and define him. He also uses current art to transform and transcend his previous self. So in, that leads to another elements or other characteristics of his artistic creation, which is seem to be a fragmentation. It's very hard to nail, which is Mu Xin uh, style or you know art artistic characteristics, unlike some very famous, you know, best-selling artists that we are familiar with, we, they all must have a personal style, right? 个人风格 in Chinese, right? And in Mu Xin, he tried always to go forward to create something new. It's in, in true sense, a creativity that's not, never been imprisoned by the art he's created before. I think for this character, this true understanding of art in Mu Xin leads him to be able to deal with the destruction of his writings and his paintings in that scale. The entire, by the time of 50 something, entire lifetime of work, work had been destroyed or still in hiding. Most of artists, artists would be destroyed by then. But because art, art for him is really this creation, I'm creating the moment, creating a new person, a new world in him. He survived that and thrived on that. I think that's all what I need to say. And I'll hand this to the uh, executive producer of the film. We need to learn uh, so much more about the film from, from Fred. Thank you. So um, Fred's met Mushin three times and um, also collected some of his work before. Could you tell us why you became involved with this documentary and what you hope to achieve? First of all, I'd like to thank both Olivia Wong and Yifuan Lee for enabling uh, the screening of this film tonight. It was a very complicated process that took several months and... Uh, a lot of uh, logistical maneuvering, but they both did a fantastic job. I'd also like to thank the Asia Society, Winsome and Cassie, for you know 
getting this organized, and um, it's not a simple process. And um, I'd also, I just met Professor Wong tonight, but I would say that your brief talk really encapsulated the history um, and the, what happened during that period, and also you really got to the essence of what Mushin was all about. And there's really nothing more that I could say about him that you haven't covered tonight, except a lot of personal things, which um, are of interest to me. But what Professor Wong said really nailed um, this whole um, process around this very unique individual. Um, I have a few slides, um, and I think it's probably, you know, in English we say a picture's worth a thousand words, so I think I'll let you see some slides. Hopefully this will work. Okay, this is the first slide. So this is Alexander Monroe on the left, Mushin in the middle, Vishaka Desai, who was the curator of the Asia Society Gallery in New York in 2003. And um, Alexander Monroe was really the person who put Mushin on the map, who was responsible for all of his uh, fame, limited amount of fame in the US, and uh, was also very helpful on this, producing this film. And, and also she was very helpful in retrieving about 50, 55 paintings that were in a gallery in New York back to China with Don Ching's help. And now those paintings are in the Mushin Museum and they're installed and you can see them. Um, this is a picture of the, a photo of the two filmmakers, you know, the two Caucasians who are from New York. So, you know, next to Mushin, Chen Danqing and uh, Yang Yen, who was the sort of fixer and the logistical person and translator. Um, the, a very interesting story. I mean, I could talk for hours, but I only have a few minutes. I met Mushin in 1998 in New York, and I bought several paintings of his before I met him, and then I bought a few more. So I wound up owning five paintings. And... Um, Somewhat later, like in 2010, I moved to Shanghai and I was interested in um, trying to find him. I knew he was there. And I actually brought the catalog that you saw Chen Danqing leafing through. I brought it to Shanghai. People in Shanghai, the few people that knew anything about him, only knew him as a writer. And it's sort of really remarkable. These two uh, New Yorkers researched making a film about con Chinese contemporary art around 2007, 8, and 9, and came to the conclusion that Mushin's life was the most interesting. And they had no money, and they started you know, trying to network, and they contacted Melissa Chu at the Asia Society, and Melissa knew me, and she knew that I owned these paintings. So in November of 2010, they sent me an email and told me what they wanted to talk about, making a documentary film. So that's how this thing developed, and it was quite remarkable because they came to Shanghai, I sent them some money, paid for the film uh, equipment that they needed to rent and paid for Yen, Yang Yen's uh, salary, and Don Qing bought them two plane tickets, and then he flew to, from Beijing to Shanghai and picked them up and took them to Wujen. They spent 10 days in Wujen. They actually filmed 20 hours of film. So what you see is very little of what they actually shot. Um, it took four years of editing and a, a bunch of different iterations of the film before uh, they were satisfied and Don Ching and I were satisfied. These two guys are great filmmakers, a cameraman and an editor, but they really knew very little about Chinese culture or Chinese society. So whenever I was in New York or Don Ching was in New York, we were both viewing the earlier um, iterations of the film and giving them feedback. And so I'm very pleased with the final outcome. And you can see that they've really integrated uh, film from other sources and um, edited the 20 hours into 35 minutes, which is quite remarkable. This is about six weeks before Mushin died. I visited him with uh, Alexander Monroe. And uh, this was sort of the time when he asked us to get the paintings back from the gallery that still had control over them. 
this is a Mushin birthday in the 1990s, and there are a bunch of people here. The only one, I, only two I know are Chen Dan Ching, who's kind of half hidden there on the floor, and his wife, uh, Wang Laosha, behind him. This is the Mushin Museum. The city of Wujen commissioned two, art two architects to build this. They both worked and trained with Bei Yu Ming for over 10 years. One is uh, Okimoto Hiroshi, and the other is uh, Lin Bing. And uh, it's quite a remarkably beautiful museum in a beautiful setting. And if you haven't been there, I would recommend it. This is another picture. This is a rock garden at the museum that was designed by Leo Dan, who was one of those students who Mushin taught in New York. And there was actually one of the photographs in the film, Lou Dan is sitting in the front row with his hair is not white at that point, so maybe you didn't recognize him. And these are five paintings that I bought around 1997 or 1998. They're gouache on paper. And they're 26 inches by 26 inches, so much, much larger than the paintings that you've seen in the film, which were basically the size of a postcard. And this is... Uh, Mushin's funeral service in Beijing. There was one in Wujen, which was well attended by Chinese students, and then there was one in Beijing because there were so many young people in Beijing who wanted to uh, show their respect. It's Don Ching and, and myself. And, uh, how are we doing on time? Uh, <coughs> I had been uh, collecting Chinese ink painting for about uh, more than 10 years when I met Mushin's work or was introduced. And it was really Alexandra Monroe who was instrumental in you know, encouraging me to buy it. Um, Elizabeth Wong Gallery represented him and she also represented other sort of senior or elderly Chinese artists, including my teacher Wang Feng Yu. And so I went to the gallery and I saw a couple of paintings and I bought them. They were actually a little bit on the expensive side given it was 1998. But I knew they were good and I also knew that Alexander was going to have an exhibition for him sooner or later. So that incremental bit of knowledge was very helpful. Um, and then somewhat later, maybe six months or a year later, I was back in New York and I requested that I could meet with him. And so I did. And he came to the gallery with his own translator. And we talked. He was very dapper. In uh, Chinese, the Cheng Yu is Bin Bin Yo Li. He was, Don Ching mentioned, always well-dressed. And that was true. And after meeting him and having a, you know interesting conversation, um, I bought several more paintings. And that's how I wound up uh, owning these paintings. Um, uh, it was actually a break from my uh, past collecting because I was only collecting ink on, on paper. These were gouache, but I really felt there was something unique about him. And uh, the one painting that I thought was the most interesting, I told him, reminded me of uh, Cezanne's late work on, when he was in Aix-en-Provence and that it was a, had a kind of pre-Cubist feeling and Mouchin said in English, <clears throat> that Cezanne was the greatest artist of the 20th century, which is a stretch because Cezanne died in 1905 and Picasso lived a long time in the 20th century. But Cezanne was important for sure. Thank you. Kai Bing, could you comment on Mu Xing's reception in academia, both in China and abroad, and perhaps su suggest ways to increase awareness? Okay, thank you. Actually, I'm very excited to be here, but also very nervous because both of my former supervisor, Dr. Wang, and my current supervisor, Dr. Lin, are also here. So it's kind of like um, oral defense, some kind of. Um, but by, to start with, I think I want to quote from Wu Xin himself how he talked about his own literature. Um, it's my translation, so it just does a job. Um, don't even bother to think of a historical position to put me in. I don't have a position. I only left, I only left traces. 
I have no uh, pioneers, neither will I have successors. I belong to no, uh, be I belong to no school, and I never was interested to being so. I'm nothing but a new room. I have no system. I have no doctrine. I'm just good at fabricating things that are real. I don't belong to the past. I don't belong to the present. I kind of belong to the future. So, yeah. Um, I also want to uh, talk a little bit how I get myself to study machine because my project only uh, progressed like for four months. So I'm here my, as much as to share as to learn, you know, to be corrected. Um, I first come across on the machine works in Chongqing where I work actually for the government. Um, I was just fascinated by him because when I was desperately need someone to guide my life, kind of like that. And um, after I read his books, and then I went to Wuzhen myself twice to kind of just to feel how you know how this person belonged to this place. And then I, 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 after I came back from the Wuzhen, then. I secretly kind of prepare for my applications to a PhD program. Then I later I got admission, and then I came to HKU last year. So um, I want to thank Dr. Wang for setting up the kind of a broader cultural background for talk about the Mushin, because I think Mushin is very probably the last surprise we are going to discover. Uh, in the context of a modern Chinese literature, literature, especially in the context of a post-cultural rev revolution, uh, because after 1978, we discovered Zhang Ailin, Chen Zhongshu, Shen Chongwen, these kind of uh, uh, old guys, but we never expected that we will have another surprise like Mu Xin, because uh, I think he himself like single-handedly showed us how modern Chinese literature would look like if it is not interrupted by many kind of a, a war, civil war, uh, 1949, cultural revolution, those kind of things. And um, he is so special because he can so freely and gracefully travel back and forth in both the tradition and the modernity and the Chinese literature and the world literature. Um, I think I, I can have give you a few examples. Um, he composed like 300 poems called uh, Shi Jin Yan. It's an imita uh, imitation of the Shi Jin, <laughs> Shi Jin uh, but it's not in the traditional Asian form. It's in a Shakespearean sonnet. So I, I, I mean, that has never been done before. It's just so difficult to understand. Um, also, I want to show like, how can he write his um, prose in a way in the stream, con uh, the stream of consciousness. But it's not, a, you know, usually it's a for a novel, right? But he applied that in writing his prose. And um, most Strikingly, I think, is like, according to re recent research, most of his poems are, not, are actually not original. It's kind of a fake. It's kind of a reproduced on, uh, based on a large corpse of previous text produced by, you know, both Asian, like, Chinese writers and the foreign writers. He kind of, you know, he doesn't want to write his own work. He just writes write based on other people. So, I mean, that also set a lot of traps for people to, because uh, I think now people are so obsessed with self-identity. So if you, when you are writing, you always like write about yourself. But motion just does not, just does not. Um, and another thing is like, most of his poems are about European history, culture, landscape, but he never, went to Europe, except like in 1994, he was in London for just a month. So I think for me, it's still a very challenging job to 
first to know the background, to know the motivation, why he thinks that's important, that's kind of artistic to do such kind of a literature, such kind of a creation. Um, yeah. but, but the reception, I think, is quite disappointing because even though Mushin has been like received for over 30 years, but there's no serious study in the academia, both in Chinese and uh, in you know the uh, overseas. Um, there are a few articles contributed by like overseas Chinese scholars, but most of them are Mushin friends. So they just kind of commented on Mushin's work. Uh, recently, there are like postgraduate master thesis about Mushin, but they're mostly done by young students from China. So it's kind of a, uh, the establishment, so called, it's kind of a refusing Mushin kind of a little bit. So it's still, uh, yeah. But, but Mushin is also very difficult to start to the study because we need like a, a lot of collaboration from different disciplines and different regions. And with, I think we desperately need some like translation of his work because I, I personally, I believe like actually his home court is not in China for him to really to be appreciated. Yeah. Thank you, Kai Bing. Um, I'd like to open it up to questions from the, the audience. With, with all this stuff going on, and he had to produce his work in secret, um, except for the New York period, and and I guess when he was studying, when he's really young, so he just he never really painted with anybody. He didn't have anyone to throw ideas about or drink tea with or anything, except for when he was young and and before the war, and then in New York, it's, is that right? He never had any, you know, painting buddies or literary buddies in, in, until he, he, he sort of got to America? I'm not an academic, but I know a little bit about his life. Um, he was a loner in some ways, and um, but he did study with Lin Feng Mian, and he did study with uh, uh, Li Hai, Hai Su. So um, and he went to school in China, in, uh, in Shanghai, and he had that experience. Um, he was a private, very private person, so there isn't there are gaps in the knowledge, which is why maybe people are intimidated to do their PhD other than Gaibin. Um and when he was in New York, he was the teacher. And his the people that he talked to about art were, his, were the students. And he had a very close relationship with Leo Dan, who is very well known now. And he had a very close relationship with uh, Chen Danqing and some other people. There's another artist who's an oil painter who lives in Hangzhou now, Cao Li Wei, um, who came to Mushin's funeral in uh, Wuzhen and also in Beijing, and who he and I were able to talk about Mushin because his English was much better than my Chinese. So there were people along the way, um, but you know, education was interrupted by the, by the Civil War, by the Japanese invasion. It's just so many things. I mean, there was not a smooth trip. So um, I do know that Lin Feng Mian was of serious influence on him. Hi, thank you very much to the panel for speaking. I have another question following up on that. So um, what I don't think the documentary really talked about is he went from China to um, New York and was kind of in exile and then he became a teacher. Uh, why did he, how did he become a teacher? And if his education was interrupted, why did he, how did he get contact with that circle and then kind of get known from that? I'm just curious. You know, he came to New York in 1982, and as the film showed, he came on a, a visa for a you know, scholarship at the Art Students League. And I just ran into Joan Liebold Cohn, who's a 
sort of the grand dame of modern Chinese uh, painting from an American standpoint. And she told me that uh, she and her husband were influential in helping these artists get out of China. And the way they did is they got them visas to study at some art school. Um, Mushin, you know, came to New York and he had no money and no way of supporting himself. And this process of, you know, teaching these other, you know, expats, you know, the Chinese in exile, or, uh, was the way that he supported himself and also the way that he built a community uh, of friendship with uh, people. Um, and uh, he never had a lot of money, I don't think, in any time in the 80s or the 90s and lived quite frugally. So, so these people that you taught, they weren't necessarily other artists that also were in exile? No, they were. They were, you know, at that, at that t point in time, you, in the 80s, you had Ai Weiwei, you had uh, Xu Bing, uh, who came later in the 80s, but in the 80s, you had even some filmmakers. I think Chen Kaiga was in New York. So, you know, when you're an expat, you know, you see it here, but everywhere, expats, wherever they are, from whatever nationality, they usually find each other. So it was the place to be, basically, in New well, York, for these New Chinese York, artists, were, it seems like. This was, you know, China was... China was very repressed society from 49 to 79. And these people left in the early 80s and New York was, you know, a, a wonderful experiment for them. And they all had, you know, great experiences. Some stayed, some went back to China. Um, but they found each other, you know, like even in Hong Kong or in Japan, when Americans come here, they have an American club. Well, they didn't have a Chinese club because they didn't have, it, nobody could afford to rent a place. And so they would have, you know, potlucks in people's apartments, and he would come and talk, and the, and the students or the people, you know, they weren't formerly students, but they were, you know, listening to him. These people had no education. From 66 to 76, there was no education system, and so all the people who were, should have been in high school or college or graduate school had no education for 10 years, and certainly no education about Western culture. So this was a logical fit. These people needed some training. They were curious, and he had the knowledge, and he needed the money. And, but it was also, I think, a tremendous amount of camaraderie for him. There's a one uh, young man I met in Taiwan who's from Taiwan, Yang Zhe, who uh, was the one who actually got him published in Taiwan. And he was not from mainland China. He was from Taiwan, but he was, at that time, they were all you know, poor and struggling, so there wasn't any kind of hostility or rivalry between the mainland Chinese and the Taiwanese the way there might be in the current environment. Thank you. Hi, uh, I'm a fan of Mu Xing's writing, but I don't know much about art history. So I'm just wondering if Professor Wang and maybe Mr. Golden could tell us how would you place his work in the tradition of Chinese art? You know, whether his painting, you know, can be read in the tradition of, I don't know, San Sui or, or something else. I mean, this is a very stupid question, but I really wanted to know how, how would you place his work in the, in the tradition of Chinese art history? Thank you. I mean, his art is a changing process. Uh, the 30 some uh, paintings donated to, not donated, so at the collection of Yale, those are slightly earlier, pre New York, I would say, right? Pre New York paintings. Pre New York. Pre -New York. You would see the, from the titles, these are memories and uh, imaginations of, uh, you know, Tang poetry, uh, climbing the Chu Mountains, you know, this, uh, this is one of the titles I remember. It's uh, the, the Yi Jing, the, in, the intention was very classical, okay? He had very good classical training, great calligraphy, knew all the great classical artists. He did not admire all of them, not the Ming Qing artists, but definitely Tang Song artists. So he has very particular taste. Uh, that memory, 
uh, he developed also in prison. You know, when he tried to write, he was trying to live on the memory, uh, the nourishment from the libraries and from early trainings, write about the arts and literature. So when that you know, came out in the visual form in the paintings he did in China, um, it is really a great experiment, a, a, a um, brilliant experiment that trying to make, maybe it's not even his goal, but as a result, as an effect, it's definitely a modern Chinese man was making modern Chinese art, modern art, using all the cultural resources he had. So I would say that the pre-New York paintings had probably stronger uh, uh, proportions uh, of uh, nutrition coming from the, the classical Chinese tradition, not so much in techniques or materials, but in aesthetics. And the later on, you could say that he ventured to be, even, even in those paintings, you also see Saison, right? And later on, he experimented total abstraction using the, the material, also not ink and rice paper, right? Gourage and, and this kind of a, uh, technique you see that really uh, kind of print and see what incidental effect this gouache would produce. And from there, you experiment with all kinds of material. So... It's a long answer to a long answer to your short question. There's definitely a connection, but it's, it's not his intention to become a Chinese painter. He's very free. He would use any cultural resources to search for a kind of modern art that is, I think, so for certain period he's more cosmopolitan. For certain period he's more classical. It changes. Yeah. I would just add one thing. Um, I think Professor Wang once again has uh, nailed it. Um, he had an, a, a phrase that he used to describe himself. And so, one, he really didn't want to be categorized as a Chinese painter or a Western painter. But when he talked about himself, he said he was a Shaoxing Greek. And basically, he had you know, absorbed the sophistication from two different civilizations and... Um, created his own world. Thank you. Um, unfortunately, we've run out of time. I hope you've enjoyed this documentary and been enlightened by our panelists. Thank you for coming, and thank you to Asia Society for hosting us.